All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started so we can keep things rolling on time here. My name is Jenna Failer. I'm a field crops extension aid extension educator up in the upper part of the thumb of Michigan. And this morning, we have a fun docket for you. I want to welcome Dr. Jamie Wilbur, who is the MSU Potato and Sugar Beet Pathology Program Assistant Professor, and I believe she might have an extend, halfway extension appointment or some sorts of it. Jamie, thank you for joining us and feel free to take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenna. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Jamie. I'm the Michigan State Potato and Sugar Beet Pathologist, and yes, I have a 60% extension, 40% research appointment. So glad to be joining you all this morning. Should be an exciting time of the season to join you about this topic. So I'll be talking about Cercospora leaf throat management. This is the most severe foliar disease of sugar beet in Michigan, and it is caused by the foliar pathogen Cercospora baticola. It is found in most growing regions. However, it does tend to impact, um, great, have greater impacts in warm, wet areas. Individual lesions for this disease are typically circular with a uh, about the size of a pencil eraser. They have a tan or gray center with a darker brown to red border. I'm showing a picture here of a nice uh, lesion with a red, pretty strong red border. But in the center of that lesion, I wanna draw attention to a characteristic of uh, Cercospora leaf spots are these kind of black freckles inside the lesions. And those are the overwintering structure for this fungus, but they also um, are the sporulating structures. And so under uh, humid conditions, those will produce the silver needle-like spores of this fungus. And each lesion can produce hundreds of spores. And each lesion can also sporulate multiple times during the season. Um, so it is, uh, does start to ramp up inoculum quite quickly. At the whole plant level, these lesions can come together and cause the leaf to die. This will occur between 400 and 1,000 lesions, so quite a lot of inoculum. As the leaves die, the plant is defoliating and it's losing its uh, photosynthetic capacity. So it um, is causing some yield loss because it doesn't have that energy source, but it also will stimulate this regrowth um, in the center of the uh, sugar beet crowns, and that pulls valuable sugar reserves from the roots to grow more leaves. So uh, this twofold um, yield impact on both root and sugar. Yield is, is a concern and can cause up to about 40% losses, as well as downstream effects in terms of increased impurities in the extraction process and storability issues. The life cycle for this pathogen, as I mentioned, those overwintering structures are in the center of the lesions. So this pathogen is overwintering in leaf residue primarily. Under uh, favorable conditions, these uh, the resulting spores will be dispersed via wind or rain. In Michigan, we can see spores as early as April or May, um, depending on the year, but quite early in the season. As those spores are dispersed onto leaves, infection can occur um, in relatively humid and warm conditions, um, uh, which is kind of perfect for Michigan. The first spots in Michigan uh, over the last several years have tended to occur from mid-June to between late July, and again, very weather dependent. So what does this year look like for us? Uh, we use a risk uh, prediction tool called BeatCast. Uh, the link is on the bottom of the slide here and it'll be posted in the chat. Um, this tool is uh, accumulating severity values based on leaf wetness and temperature. 
Each day is assigned a value from zero to four, four being high risk. And then as these values accumulate, um, those the sum um, triggers action thresholds for first fungicide timings. For um, sensitive to resistant varieties, that can occur anywhere between 35 to 50 DSVs, depending on the risk, um, height, and the pressure, and the history of the field, um, and the variety susceptibility. Currently, this is I pulled this yesterday, so June 28th, uh, the DSV accumulation for our growing region was 16 to 36 was the maximum. So we're just getting to that uh, low end of our action thresholds. Um, however, this fungus is able to infect leaves successfully given a uh, consecutive days of elevated leaf wetness. And so I'm showing off to the right here actually between June 24th and June 27th, we did have those consecutive days of elevated risk each day in the three to four range. Uh, so infection uh, can occur and um, the sugar bee industry had noted about a doubling of their severity values over the last week. And I, I have received news that while we haven't had any spot detections yet reported, uh, most are starting their spray programs either this week or next week. So let's get into a little bit of the um, management for Circospora leaf spot. Uh, we do have cultural practices, of course, so three year crop rotations, a distancing new fields from previous fields. So, as I said, the uh, fungus is overwintering in that leaf material. I have a picture up here of some of our research that we have uh, done and published looking at different types of cultural strategies, such as um, uh, heating, heat treating the leaves to reduce that amount of overwintering inoculum, which did reduce the subsequent disease pressure. And so this is something that we're exploring more of in different types of strategies as a as a new uh, direction or facet of management. Uh, varietal resistance um, has historically been difficult to breed for. It's controlled by several genes and can uh, cost yield. However, we do have some newer sources of resistance. This is the CR plus lines that are available. Uh, they do require integrated management to prolong their use and effectiveness, um, and no varieties are completely immune to this disease. So uh, just to note that we're still in the early years with these varieties, we continue to evaluate them in the field for any other potential weaknesses or considerations required for management. And these variety results are available. The link down here to the REACH variety trial results, that link will also be in the chat. So fungicide uh, programs are also used. We have a, a variety of contact and systemic products that are effective. Um, I'm showing to the right just a snapshot of some of our annual fungicide testing research for Circospora leaf spot. For a full program of uh, rotating different products and tank mixing different products, we can successfully reduce disease and prevent uh, sugar and yield loss. There are, um, in a high epidemic year for CLS, we can apply in a susceptible variety an average of six to eight fungicide applications. So it is uh, quite a lot of pressure going on to that um, population of fungi in the field. So fungicide resistance is a major concern for us and a major challenge uh, in this and other growing regions. Because of the uh, frequency of the reproduction of the fungus and the number of times that we are spraying, um, fungicide resistance development is a high risk. And in most of our products and our active ingredients, 
some reduced insensitivity has been noted in lab testing. Uh, we do annual lab testing. And I'm showing in orange and yellow just a few of the active ingredients that do have some noted insensitivity. That is, as it gets to the right of these graphs, this uh, dashed line here, it is a higher probability that it ha may uh, not be as effective in the field. So that is something we continue to monitor. We do uh, recommend um, intensive res resistance management, including tank mixing products uh, with EVDCs or coppers using full rates and rotating chemistries. And just a note that my program does uh, this testing annually for Cercospora and Alternaria uh, from sugar beets. And we are accepting samples this season. So uh, if there's any interest in having this information uh, locally at your farm or operation, just let us know. Fungicide timing is uh, critical for effective management. And so we want to aim, target our applications to prevent the infections from occurring, especially the first round of infections because of the multiple rounds of reproduction for this fungus, we ramp up our pressure very quickly. So it's always better to be early rather than late. The first application um, here in Michigan has typically been in mid to late June over the last several years. And later applications occur every 10 to 14 days or when a particular beet cast threshold is reached, whichever occurs first. I'd like to also note some additional research going on in our program that is looking at improving the information that we have at the beginning of the season and when those first infections might occur. We have a, a good beet cast model, which is looking at infection risk. And our modeling efforts are focused on spore presence and understanding the abundance of spores at a given point. So some of our, our research is looking at different weather variables, such as leaf wetness duration has been important, as well as relative humidity, temperature, and wind speed to help disperse uh, the spores. So I want to kind of tie back in to the risk in a previous year. So previous dry year in 2021, we started the season pretty similarly, where we had a, a prolonged kind of drought dry period. So 2021 is shown at the top of this slide here in 2023, current year is shown at the bottom. But in as we get to June 1st, um, we can start to see that our cumulative DSVs are about two weeks delayed here at the beginning of June into June 15th. And then um, in 2021, by July 1st, we had met most of our action thresholds. Um, and we saw first spots in the commercial region about late July. This year, uh, the most recent information we have, our DSPs are still a little bit behind, but we're expecting this um, period of humidity kind of continue. And so that is the reason for these uh, expected applications happening this week or next week, uh, because the active part of the season is now just getting to us, upon us, and some of this rain has helped to move things along disease-wise. I want to just close with a reminder that we do have several other foliar diseases. Alternaria leaf spot is the second most important or prevalent disease in Michigan. It's morphologically different, but their fungicide uh, sensitivities are slightly different. So if there's any questions about um, that in particular, our program does some testing there and can help inform some of those decisions. We also have two newer diseases on sugar beets over the past couple of years, anthracnose um, and stemphelium leaf spot. So if you're seeing anything strange in the field, let us know. 
always feel free to send in a sample to our beat pathology programs or the diagnostic services as well. So with that, I'll close up. I'll hand it over to Jeff and just a special thanks to our sugar beet industry support. And I'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat and ask the Q&A afterwards. I think we're gonna move into our Q&A session. And right now we're a little short on questions, guys. So please drop some things in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I believe Marty had an update that he would like to give us while we wait for some questions to come in. Sure. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, yeah, just quickly, um, tar spot's been found in Iowa. Tar spot of corn we're talking about has been found in Iowa, about six counties there, I think, uh, Nebraska and Kansas. Um, looking at the precip events and the colleague there in Iowa, it seems that they've had, although they are in drought, they have had more precip events than we have had. So it makes sense um, from that uh, perspective. Um, typically, with a single fungicide application, we see the best return um, or the most highest chance of return on investment application between sort of tasseling through to about the R3 growth stage. Um, so, yeah, we're watching the risk models and we'll keep you updated as we start to hear any reports around Michigan. But that's what I wanted to get across this morning. Thank you, Marty. Thanks. Clay, I'm not 100% sure what you're asking in your question. My guess is it has to do with the very spotty precipitation. But if anybody else can interpret this different, how far should the fields be apart? I think that question is for Janie and she's muted. There we go. Yeah, so Clay, if if that's for me, yep. So the previous year fields, um, the new fields should be at least a hundred feet from the previous year fields. That's the uh, most common distance that the spores can move between. Um, so preferably not adjacent as any infections that can get into the new field will ramp up and continue to spread into the field. And how many years apart in the rotation? Yep, we recommend three gives the, the leaves uh, a chance to break down between crops. And that's really the reservoir for this, this fungus. So, um, are, there any, are there any other hosts for the fungus? Yes, yes. Um, this Maybe. fungus can infect um, all beet hosts. Uh, so table beet, chard, sugar beet, um, but it also does have some common weed hosts, such as lamb's quarter um, and some uh, a, a few other types of weeds. So successful weed management is also important. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions yet. Jamie, you mentioned BeatCast uses, you know, all of the relative humidity data and whatnot. Is that pretty, and leaf wetness, is that pretty generalized or do you have sensors throughout that area? Yeah, this uh, BeatCast network uses its own kind of sensors and it, the model is based on leaf wetness and temperature for the leaf spot model. They do have some other models as well um, through their uh, network. and so. They, they collect other weather data that goes into that. Thank you. Um, any of our other specialists on right now have anything they would like to say? Any updates? Let's see who we got on. I'm going to start calling people out if I see you. Christy, anything anything you want to give us? Um, just to be aware that we're encroaching quickly on the uh, dicamba application window, which is June 30th. So if you are Spraying your extend flex beans, those definitely need to happen before June 30th. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to guess this question's for you. Will the wildlife smoke provide a deposition of sulfur? Interesting question. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, out of my the air chemistry, but I, I, I did work on this way back when in, a, in, in grad school. Uh, I think the answer is probably no. Uh, 
uh, sulfur, the, the source of the sulfur would be from it. It would be different. And most of the combustible material now, we're, again, we're looking at forests, uh, do not contain high sulfur content. So likely the, the, the answer here is, is, is no. Okay. Manny, I see you're on. Any updates? Yeah. I can talk a little bit about the smoke issue. I think uh, Phil uh, put a, a question, for, I think, directly for me in the chat box. I think people have been wondering uh, what's the impact of smoke on crop growth and development, right, and eventually yield. So I, I don't think there's enough research on this topic, uh, uh, but I think what I can think of is generally when we have smoke in the air, it can reduce the amount of light the plants are getting, right? So it, in theory, it can lower your yield potential because the plant is getting less amount of sunlight that it needs for photosynthesis, for right? And I think it's especially true for corn. Corn plant is typically limited by light level. It has a different photosynthetic pathway. It has plenty of carbon dioxide, so it needs more light. So the impact can be more on a corn plant than a, a soybean plant. In theory, there's a potential benefit to smoke, so can again reduce the amount of light plant is getting, but it, it also sort of like scatters the light around, right? So it increases the amount of light, what we call a diffuse light, uh, uh, and that is a positive thing for, for the plant. So if the smoke is not too bad, in theory, the to total amount of light plant is getting can actually be higher and it can have a, a potential positive impact. But with the amount of smoke we have been seeing at least here in Lansing area over the last two days, uh, it can can potentially be a, be a negative. But uh, again, I think we'll try to uh, uh, dig a little bit more into literature and see see what's going on there. All right. In Leon, terms of, Leon said wood yeah. doesn't contain much sulfur, Manny. So I don't know if that changes anything. Yeah, that I don't know. I think Kurt probably would know the answer better. I mean, even if it does contain any sulfur, I would think it's going to take time for the for the sulfur to be available to the plant, right? I think that, that, that's the tricky part. That even if it's there, I don't think it's going to be immediately available. So it'll probably, again, we need to be thinking through, through that in terms of looking uh, more at research. And then I think right. I was thinking just a quick comment, you know, again, uh, of this water stress, you know, I, I'm glad again, uh, we have had some rain and uh, Jeff uh, gave us good news. Uh, looks like we uh, we have more in the forecast. So I'm hearing a lot of thunder around here uh, in Lansing, but uh, not seeing any rain. So hopefully, hopefully <laughs> it'll, it'll come. But yeah, again, our corn crop is getting to a point where it's already determining a number of potential kernels on, the, on, on that year, right? So... Again, hopefully uh, we are getting this rain in, in a timely manner. We have, I have seen a lot of uneven stands uh, out there and that's going to have uh, an impact on, on yield. Uh, again, more so in corn than on, on soybean. But if we get this uh, rain, so I think we are just getting them in time to at least have uh, a lower impact on our, on our yield potentials. Thanks, Manny. We have a question for Marty and or Jeff. With increasing humidity and rain chances, will smoke increase our tar spot chances? Same question with white mold. Marty, I think that one's yours. <laughs> no worries, Jeff. I was wondering where you were going to go. Um, yeah, so basically any increased leaf moisture is going to drive um, the potential for disease. So, yeah, if smoke is, you know, giving us, um, you know, extended leaf wetness, um, then yes, like that that can be a factor. Um, but directly, I don't think there's there's going to be a great deal that smoke's going to have on disease just indirectly through maybe prolonged leaf moisture events. And, and white mold's different. Um, you know, we're really thinking about soil moisture there and getting things set up, right, um, for those white mold mushrooms, the apothecia to form. So they're looking for actual soil moisture and then canopy closure too. Jamie, is it going to affect your diseases? Yeah, actually, I, in my potato hat, um, I was thinking of some of the white mold questions that came up at the end of last week's session about um, the dryness affecting the apothecial formation, those mushroom formation. And I did find a couple of studies that Overall, those dormant structures require about four weeks of 
conditioning, cool, wet period. So if that happens kind of earlier in the spring, the dry period can halt that germination. But then after a wedding event, this recent rain, they, uh, those sclerotia can germinate, those mushrooms can germinate within about three to four weeks, probably still. So as Marty said, if the flowers are still there, if there's canopy row closure, um, then that could coincide um, if that's happening at about the same time. Perfect, Jamie. The next question is for you. You mentioned heat as a treatment for C. Baticola, I suck at scientific <laughs> pronunciations, I apologize, in sugar beets. What sure, using sure. heat in the field entails? So our particular application entailed a, a propane-fueled burner, and this is something that was used for some weed control or plastic mulch control previously, uh, but we outfitted it to essentially heat the sugar beet leaves just prior to defoliation. Um, so we are getting the infected tissue um, in contact with high heat, not burning them, uh, but for a brief few three to five seconds of about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. This fungus is pretty sensitive to temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're aiming for hot and quick and uh, it did appear to have an instant um, immediate effect on the viability of the fungus in the leaf tissue. And then as we monitored, monitored it over the winter and into the spring, it did reduce the survival and the amount of spores that were then produced. So I'm happy to help send uh, any of our plans. We were using a small plot uh, research scale burner but um, these results also were similar to some uh, similar studies in Minnesota, and they were using kind of a, a handheld scale, but same uh, heat treatment in the spring versus ours was in the fall. So a couple of different ways to go about that. Do you see there maybe being a potential in the future for that to be used on more of a commercial level, Jamie? So we were testing it as more of a proof of concept for that particular weakness for this pathogen and being able to target the overwintering inoculum as a new direction for management. But there was some interest with the sugar beet industry and certain growers that that um, setup equipment wise could work with the, the way the defoliators and the harvesters are set up. So it's plausible it's feasible <laughs> very nice you never know for sure until they try it right <laughs> um you mentioned that in this you some of your susceptible varieties you know you're going out six to eight times and you mentioned nothing's truly not susceptible but you do have some of those that are more resistant are you able to see any reductions in fungicide applications in those yes we have seen um cost-effective reductions in fungicide use without um, noticeable yield loss in the newer resistant varieties. The resistant varieties do get disease, they do get those lesions, and that does add to the amount of inoculum that's around. And so they, uh, most of those resistant varieties, they, they hang on for a pretty good time. But if there's enough spores and enough favorable conditions, they, they can get disease. So it's all about the integrated incorporation of them into a program. Perfect. Chris Stefanzo, I see you're on. Any insect updates for us? Nope. I had an interesting I, I question. I don't, I don't think that, you know, one inch of rain doesn't uh, necessarily <laughs> stop spider mites. So don't get too excited unless uh, the pattern changes a little bit and, you know, you can raise some humidity and de-stress the plants a little bit, so. I had an interesting question come up yesterday and maybe you'll have an answer that other people will be interested in. They're curious where all the piercing sucking insects are currently coming from. Like, where did they come from, Chris? Well, po well potato leaf hopper is a migrator. So it was overwintering like uh, a senior Michigan person in Florida and Georgia and those sorts of areas. And then it blows up typically by the end of May. 
Uh, tarnished plant bug overwinters here. That's in a lot of crops. That would just be in crop residue and edges of fields and things like that. Uh, what else do we have? Something aphids. like soybean aphid is is a lot different. That uh, leaves your fields in the in the fall, and you get boy aphids. That's the only time that that happens. And there's a mating, and there's eggs on buckthorn, which. Uh, some of the species of buckthorn, I don't think all of them, are actually from Asia as well. So the reason it can successfully overwinter isn't just that we brought soybean over, we brought the overwintering host. That's very common for aphids. They overwinter back on a tree host in it as an egg. So initially those, the first soybean aphids, just as the buckthorn shrub um, buds break, those eggs also hatch simultaneously and they feed a generation or two on the buckthorn, nice juicy nitrogen filled material. And then there are migrators that then move out of those natural areas. And if you've planted early, some fields catch that flight. And those are the ones that have aphids in there now. Um, and then last, spider mites, I've, they will they will overwinter again, you know, in residue and crop residue and things like that. And they, they typically will come out of those, those field edges. So some stuff is migrating, some stuff is adult and it's ready when it comes in the field to feed like, you know, tarnished plant bug. Other things are coming with, a, with, an, with an egg stage. So each pest is a little bit different. Thanks, Chris. Do we have any other specialists on who have anything they would like to mention? There was a one question in the chat, Jenna. Oh, well, perfect. About, it looks like it's for you. Take it away, Jamie. Yeah, <laughs> the, the three to five second treatment. So uh, that's a great question. And that does factor into the feasibility of this treatment. Our treatment was tested at one mile per hour through the field and three miles per hour through the field. And the one mile per hour through the field was effective and the three mile per hour was a little bit more variable. And so it is a quite a slow speed, but it was a constant speed, so. Great questions, Clay, thank you. And I should mention that this is research, uh, that was all the research by a graduate student in my program, Alex Hernandez, that she's on this morning. Shout out to her. Perfect. If we don't have any more questions from anybody or any specialists who want to mention anything, we are going to go ahead and end it and give everybody back a little bit of their morning here. So we want to thank everybody for attending this morning's virtual breakfast. And we want to thank Jamie and Jeff for being here as well as all of our other specialists who had anything to give us. And with that being said, next week, we look forward to seeing you. And I believe it's Young Suck, Jeff, with Young Suck as, as our speaker and Jeff as per usual, bringing up the tail end for us. Thank you and have a great day.